The legend of the Black Knight satellite tells us that a spaceship of extraterrestrial origin has been orbiting Earth for many, many years. Sounds crazy, right? But over the years, the supporters of the theory have gathered a lot of evidence to prove it. So let's look at it and judge for ourselves. 1899. Famous scientist Nikola Tesla built a giant tower in his laboratory in Colorado Springs. This tower was supposed to allow him to study atmospheric electricity and wireless energy. Everything went fine until one day he discovered something unexpected. The tower began to catch a signal that seemed to be artificial. At first Tesla thought that the signal was coming from somewhere in the atmosphere. But it turned out that it had been coming from an even greater height, from outer space. Tesla decided that this signal was sent by some extraterrestrial life. However, the scientific community ignored his theory. Although they respected Tesla's genius, they still considered him to be a weirdo. But a few years later, Tesla's reports were confirmed. The inventor of the wireless radio, Guglielmo Marconi, intercepted similar signals. Then in 1927, Norwegian radio engineer Georgen Holz noticed something unusual. When he sent signals at a certain wavelength, they were sent back to him a few seconds later. At first, he thought it could be an ordinary radio echo. It's not uncommon for short radio waves to bounce between Earth and the stratosphere. This phenomenon is called propagation. But usually it happens very quickly, in about one seventh of a second after the original transmission. However, the signals that Holz received took about 15 seconds to get back. They also didn't match the radio echo people were used to. The engineer wasn't the only one to witness this phenomenon. Many radio enthusiasts discovered and confirmed these signals, but no one found any explanation. So what was it? Could Tesla have been right this whole time? Let's unpack this. First of all, the signals did exist, and they've been documented by many people. However, Tesla and Macron's signals and Hull's echoes are completely different things. In reality, Tesla and Macron cut signals coming from pulsars. Pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars. Those get born when stars greater than our sun finish their life cycle. After that, they become neutron stars and receive such a strong impulse that they begin to rotate at an insane speed. At the same time, the radio waves pulsars emit reach very far, as far as our planet. Pulsars were discovered only in 1968, so it's not surprising that Tesla and Macroni couldn't explain the data they had received. But what about Jordan Hulls? What he discovered is now known as LDEs, or long-delayed echoes. It's a more complicated concept because, to be honest, these echoes still remain a mystery. Scientists suggest that LDEs may be caused by something in Earth's atmosphere, or they might be reflected from the Sun's plasma clouds or even from the Moon. Unfortunately, we don't know the truth yet. The next incident took place in 1960. The New York Times published an article which said an unidentified silent satellite has been discovered circling Earth in a near-polar orbit by United States tracking stations. The identity and origin of the mysterious satellite, which has been dubbed the Dark Satellite, are unknown despite nearly two weeks of tracking. Many people believe that this must be the famous Black Knight satellite. However, later scientists confirmed that it was actually the remnants of a regular satellite that had gone astray. It malfunctioned and the thrusters sent it in the wrong direction, they claimed. Anyway, this old story led to renewed interest in the Black Knight satellite. Astronomers all over the world started claiming to have observed it. Almost any strange celestial object could become the famous dark spaceship. But up to this point, all the photos and data about the Black Knight satellite have come from observatories on Earth. To prove or disprove its existence, people needed some witnesses in orbit. Gordon Cooper was a pilot and one of the first astronauts in human history. In 1963, he took part in the longest American space mission at that time, Mercury Atlas 9. During the flight, he discovered some strange green object, possibly of extraterrestrial origin, in front of his module. He then told his crew on Earth about that. NBC News picked up on the news and tried to interview Cooper about it. But strangely, neither NASA's mission transcripts nor Cooper seemed to give much importance to this fact, as if that didn't happen at all. 
Later, the official NASA's explanation was there was an electronic malfunction on Cooper's craft. It led to increased levels of carbon dioxide, which in turn caused Cooper to hallucinate. Cooper agreed with this version. Maybe it's just a curious coincidence that when he retired, he became interested in searching for extraterrestrial life. But even if we assume that all this is true and there is some mysterious spaceship in Earth's orbit, what do they want from us? Why would they be watching us? In 1973, Duncan Alasdair Lunan, a Scottish researcher, decided to investigate this. He gathered all the data on LDEs collected by Norwegian scientists and began to study it. Suddenly, he noticed some deviations that could hide a code. He arranged the data into a graph, where one axis meant the delay in time between the echoes, and the other the position of the echo in the sequence. It turned out to be a collection of dots, which looked like some sort of space map, namely the map of the constellation Bortis. Lunen began to analyze the echoes recorded by French astronomers in 1929. Again, he got the same constellation, but one of the stars was in a slightly different place. Lunen then thought, what if it's actually a star map from the past? After rewinding the time, Lunen finally got the whole picture. He discovered that this was how the constellation looked 13,000 years ago, which probably meant that they could have been watching us for thousands of years. In 1973, Lunan gave an interview to the British magazine Spaceflight. He said that he had deciphered the radio message hidden in the LDEs. Here is what it said. Start here. Our home is Ypsilon Budis, which is a double star. We live on the sixth planet of seven coming from the Sun, which is the larger of the two. Our sixth planet has one moon. Our fourth planet has three. Our first and third planets each have one. Our probe is in the position of Arcturus, known in our maps. Ugh, goosebumps. But even though these reports were published in the New York Times, Time and other well-known magazines, no one really took this topic seriously. Unfortunately, Lunan's theory wasn't really backed up by any evidence. Later, he withdrew it himself, saying that he had made obvious mistakes and that his methods had been unscientific. According to him, he had just been making guesses about what these signals might mean. And finally, the last part of our story. This photo. On the 4th of December 1998, the Endeavour spacecraft embarked on the STS-88 mission. This was the first mission to the International Space Station. And then, on the 11th of December, NASA took and published a series of images where you could clearly see an unusual object in Earth's orbit. These photos were immediately picked up by the public. Everyone thought it was the Black Knight satellite, which had been discussed for years. Had it finally been found after 100 years of speculation? But as usual, the truth turned out to be much more boring. During the mission, one of the astronauts was installing a thermal cover, but the coating was poorly fixed. It broke off and flew away. The photos were taken just to document this event. The Black Knight is a very interesting legend. You can dig into it for hours, looking for new information and evidence, and then watch it getting debunked. This story is a pile-up of many completely unrelated stories, reports, photos of real satellites, and so on. All this was mixed into one incoherent, illogical urban legend. Illogical, but very fascinating indeed. On August 2nd, 1996, huge, mysterious patterns appeared on an agricultural field in Chiseldon, England. No one knew what kinds of symbols those were and who left them. As soon as the local news reported this, people immediately began to make their guesses. The most popular version was a message from a civilization living on another planet. The first crop circles appeared in the 70s in many areas across the US and England. Some compared these symbols to the writings of the ancient Maya. Others thought those were messages about the approaching apocalypse. But few doubted that their authors were from another civilization. But that geometric pattern in Chiseldon was different from all the others because of an event that happened eight years later. In 2004, a man from New Mexico found a strange stone 11 miles from Roswell. The rock had the same pattern on it as the crop circle in Chiseldon. 
It's worth noting that Roswell became a famous place after, according to rumors and legends, a spaceship from another planet crashed there. Therefore, when the farmer found the stone and posted its photo on the internet, many people thought it was part of that spaceship. The stone was perfectly smooth, and the pattern was applied with incredible precision. But the most remarkable thing was its magnetic properties. It rotated counterclockwise when people put the magnet next to its northern part. When they left the magnet near the southern side, the stone turned in the other direction. Computed tomography and x-rays showed that there hadn't been any elements inside the stone that could cause rotation. It was just a smooth piece of rock. But was the Roswell rock really part of a spaceship? To answer this question, we need to move to England, the year 1976. An artist named Doug Bauer met his friend Dave Corley and invited him to create an impressive performance. At that time, people only learned about strange patterns in the fields from some books and records. And of course, none of these cases had been confirmed. The two friends understood that all this was nothing more than myths. Therefore, they decided to draw a big pattern in a wheat field in Wiltshire. Now, they didn't expect this drawing to become so popular. Many newspapers began to write about mysterious circles. Hundreds of reporters filmed it on their cameras, and people watching TV were shocked. From that moment on, crop circles became a cultural phenomenon. People mixed facts with fiction and created more and more unbelievable legends. Someone said that they had seen mysterious lights in the sky above the circles. In any case, those two friends continued to draw patterns and revealed their secret only in 2009. They also created the mysterious drawing in Chiseldon. But that Roswell rock wasn't their job. Anyway, they said that the stone was also a fake. Other artists could draw the same pattern on the rock using stone-cutting equipment. One of the most mysterious books in the world is the Voynich Manuscript. Nobody knows who its author was, but they wrote it in the 15th century. No one can understand the contents of this manuscript, consisting of 240 pages, for more than 500 years. Now, just imagine all the words were written in hand in an unknown language. Almost every page is decorated with strange images of female figures and weird unknown plants. The book was first discovered in 1912 and immediately became a cultural phenomenon. Many scientists, polyglots, and historians have tried to decipher the language and understand its meaning. They put it on the internet so everyone could try to solve the mystery. And it seems that Nicholas Gibbs, a historian and writer, managed to do this. He spent many years studying medieval Latin language and literature. Gibbs noticed the manuscript contained Latin abbreviations often used in medieval medical papers and reference books. Gibbs even found out that the book was a plagiarism of other older medical reference works. He compared the Voynich manuscript with other Latin books and found many similar words. Gibbs claimed that the manuscript was dedicated to women's health, and the mysterious flowers were real herbs and plants. But it wasn't that simple. Nicholas Gibbs was one of many who put forward the theory. Many scientists recognized his version as banal and unconvincing. Other decoders claimed that some secret code was used in the manuscript. Some were sure it was written by Dominican nuns. Others described it as a reference book on astrology and herbs. Anyway, you can find scans of the manuscript in high resolution on the internet and try to crack the code yourself. Imagine that you're walking around New York and entering a dark, deserted alley. Then you see some canvas with a beautiful picture on it lying in a trash can. You don't really understand what exactly is depicted there, but you still feel some power of art emanating from it. You take the painting home and hang it on the wall. It's been hanging there almost four years. Then you publish a photo with the painting on the website with antiques and discover that this picture is a missing masterpiece worth $1 million. This is a real story that happened to a New Yorker in 2003. Famous Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo painted this picture called Three People in 1970. One collector bought it as a gift for his wife. But in 1989, someone stole the work while they were moving to a new house. It was possible that the thief didn't appreciate this piece of art or couldn't find a buyer, so they threw it into the nearest trash can. 
the woman who found it returned the work to the owner and received a $15,000 reward. Expensive paintings often end up in trash cans. Van Gogh gave his works to various people, but they didn't take them seriously at that time. When these paintings were found many years later, they were estimated at tens of millions of dollars. For example, the artist gave his doctor his portrait. The doctor was horrified by the painting. Perhaps he didn't like the red shade of the hair. He gave the portrait to his mother, and she found a use for it. She covered the hole in her chicken coop with the picture. For more than 10 years, chickens had been running under the work of art. Then another artist found the painting. He paid the doctor pennies for it. Now it's estimated at $50 million. A similar case with a discarded work of art occurred in Italy. A gardener who worked at the Ricci Adi Gallery of Modern Art was removing ivy from the building's walls and found a rusty metal door in the thicket. He opened it and got into a dark room. There was a garbage bag lying there. The gardener wanted to throw it in the trash but decided to look inside first. And he found the lost work of famous artist Gustav Klimt. During the renovation of the gallery in 1997, someone stole the painting, Portrait of a Lady. It turned out that the thief had never taken it out of the building. Its value is estimated at $66 million. In 1901, collectors of sea sponges discovered a mysterious chest in the sea near Greece. There was a strange object inside, similar to a mechanical watch and the size of a shoebox. The finding attracted the attention of archaeologists. They quickly established that this item was created in ancient Greece about 2,200 years ago. They called it the Antikythera mechanism. Now it's in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Scientists have found out that this object is only 82 fragments, one-third of the original mechanism. It's still unknown who created it and how it works. But experts think it was a mechanical computer with bronze gears and other parts. People used it for astronomical calculations. The device could track the movements of the Sun, the Moon, and five planets of the solar system. Experts are still trying to figure out all the properties of this machine. It's considered to be the oldest computer on Earth. It proves that the level of technology 2,000 years ago was much higher than we could imagine. You're staring at white clouds far, far below your plane when you hear two flight attendants talking nearby. They sound terrified. Another moment, and they aren't standing in the aisle anymore. There, you rub your eyes, floating in the air, along with almost half of the passengers on the flight. The only thing preventing you from joining them is your seatbelt. Huh, following the rule, keep your seatbelt fastened while seated pays off. Soon, you hear the captain's strained voice. Dear passengers, he says, we've accidentally left Earth's atmosphere and reached outer space. Please try to be careful while floating around. Ah, well, it explains a lot, you think. Flight attendants are trying to pretend nothing is out of the ordinary. They're floating along the aisle, holding on to headrests and hand luggage compartments. At one point, they attempt to serve lunch, and people all over the cabin find out that orange juice looks very pretty in weightlessness, bright bubbles of different size. At one point, you decide to get all the perks and unfasten your seatbelt. Woohoo! That's fun, but also quite scary. You can't control your movements. You just float wherever a draft takes you. Sometimes you bump into other passengers, the food that's escaped the catering cart, the carts themselves, books, laptops, jackets, everything that wasn't secured in place when the plane left the atmosphere. That's probably not the safest thing, but since the speed isn't high, you come out of such encounters unscathed. If this trip lasts long enough, you'll probably have to get used to the lifestyle astronauts lead on the ISS. Let's say you suddenly become homesick and start crying. Then, your tears won't roll down your cheeks, falling down onto your t-shirt. They'll remain on your eyelids, burning them. You won't be able to take a shower, since water will simply form tiny bubbles and float away. So, you'll need to use special wet wipes to remove all that dirt off your body. Oh, and by the way, 
you won't be able to wash your clothes. You'll just have to throw them away, like astronauts on the ISS do. You'll also have to use edible toothpaste and shampoo that doesn't need rinsing. If your plane remains in space long enough for your hair to grow out, you'll have to use special scissors equipped with a tiny vacuum cleaner and a container. This way, your hair won't scatter all over the place. Imagine someone inhaling it. Uh-oh. You look around the cabin and observe a very funny phenomenon. Your fellow passengers rotate, suspended in the air. At certain intervals, they suddenly change their axis of rotation by 180 degrees, and it repeats again and again, the miracles of zero gravity. Suddenly, you spot a spider. What's it doing on this flight? Apparently, spinning its web. But since the tiny creature has to do it in weightlessness, the web is very irregularly shaped. It looks a bit like a ball. Suddenly, you feel some itchy sensation in your nose. Oh, great. You're about to sneeze. Uh, 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 some powerful force pushes you backward. And, disoriented, you crash into a wall. Everything goes black. Unfortunately, should your plane really get into outer space, your adventure wouldn't last long. Because planes are simply not designed to fly in space. The average cruising altitude of a commercial airplane is between 31,000 and 38,000 feet, which is pretty high. At this altitude, the air becomes thinner. As a result, aircraft can travel more easily and, even more importantly, burn less fuel and save more money for airline companies. They cannot fly lower, but neither can they fly higher. As soon as a passenger jet takes off from an airport, the first thing pilots do is to lead the plane as high as possible and as fast as they can. The average airplane usually reaches its cruising altitude of six to seven miles in the first 10 minutes of the flight. At the same time, each airplane has its own cruising altitude based on its weight and some other characteristics. For example, the famous supersonic passenger airliner Concorde, whose maximum speed was twice as fast as the speed of sound, used to fly way higher than other modern-day planes, at 50,000 to 60,000 feet. When planes fly at the height of 35,000 feet, they manage to avoid bad weather. For example, high winds and heavy rains ranging in the lower layers of the atmosphere. Plus, such rather high altitudes allow planes to avoid heavy airborne traffic, like helicopters and light aircraft. It also helps them stay clear of birds and big insects. And finally, and most importantly, if an emergency happens at the height of more than six miles in the air, pilots will have enough time to figure out the best solution. Okay, I get it. The higher, the better. But then, why do planes avoid moving past their cruising altitude? You see, when a plane is flying very high, it needs more time to get back to a safe altitude. And during such emergencies as rapid decompression, every second counts. Also, while traveling at such great heights, aircraft crews can't communicate with the ground services as efficiently as they do at the regular cruising altitude. The higher you get, the thinner the air becomes. That's not a bad thing, unless an airplane climbs too high. Then, the air can get too thin to provide enough lift to keep the machine in the air. It's the difference in air pressure that creates the necessary lift. But if the altitude is too high, this difference is almost non-existent. Also, if a plane rises too high, oxygen becomes too sparse to fuel the engines. A plane gets less and less air the higher it climbs. And at one point, it doesn't have any more power to keep rising. Unfortunately, it can lead to a disaster. While flying at lower altitudes, airliners can rely on the assistance of the wind. But that high up, they have to waste too much energy and fuel to stay aloft. And don't forget about the weight of the aircraft. The more the machine weighs, the more difficult it is to bring it to a certain altitude. On the other hand, if instead of boarding that Airbus 380-800, you decided to choose the X-15, you'd see a bit more of outer space. 
most people have the wrong idea of space. They think it's something very distant, something you need to try hard to reach. Outer space doesn't begin at some particular altitude above the surface of our planet. But for convenience, it was agreed that the imaginary boundary between Earth's atmosphere and outer space, also known as the Kármán line, should be at the height of 62 miles above sea level. So, back to that rocket plane, the X-15. It was designed in the mid-50s and made its first journey in June 1959. It had very thin and quite stubby wings to get as much lift and stability as it could. It traveled at more than five times the speed of sound, and it was equipped with a cutting-edge rocket motor. Its power output could be changed, and then the engine of the space plane could function like that of a conventional aircraft. The X-15 needed special fuel that contained a lot of oxygen. The plane could reach an altitude of 62 miles, which means it did reach space. Anyway, imagine you were to pilot that miracle of a plane. During the first stage of your journey, your aircraft would be carried and then drop launched from under the wing of a B-52 mothership. You would definitely feel the drop. It would be quite abrupt. The X-15 would be a very busy airplane to fly, but also very exciting. You'd be able to do some sightseeing at the edge of space, but you wouldn't likely have much time to soak up the view since you'd be pretty busy controlling your supersonic flying machine. You'd have to be very attentive and watch for any deviations. When it was time to re-enter the atmosphere and get back to Earth, you'd have to make sure the plane was lined up perfectly. Now, just relax into your window seat on an absolutely regular flight. Maybe one day, people will use planes to fly to space, but not today. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.